Hey, good day. It's Tuesday, June the 15th. I'm Martin Gagel with Market Radius Research. We've got Dominic Caruso, chairman and founder of Banksa, joining us today. Banks is a payment services provider connecting cryptocurrencies to traditional financial services companies and institutions, expanding the potential for cryptocurrency trading and transactions, implementing this in a safe and regulatory compliant manner. So thanks everyone for joining us. We appreciate it. Dominic, thanks for making time and let's hear your pitch. Fantastic. Thanks, uh, Martin, and uh, g'day, everyone. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not going to sort of get into talking about the crypto and the crypto ecosystem um, in detail, other than to say that um, it's very much moving uh, away from the, you know, the domain of the tech nerds, which, you know, I'm one of those to really being much more focused around the whole institutional uh, family office space. Um, notwithstanding all of that, we're still very, very early in the development of the ecosystem. Um, for those of you that remember the, the dot-com days in the 90s, uh, this is like 1997. Um, Amazon was just born. Um, Google and Facebook for Facebook weren't even born yet. So we're actually still very early. I'm not going to talk about Paul Tudor Jones or Elon Musk. You know, suffice to say, I'm sure everyone's read about them uh, online. Um, really, moving forward from a bank's perspective, our vision is really about bringing dig digital assets to every part of the globe. And just to give everyone a bit of a snapshot, uh, we're actually the world's first stock exchange listed PSP, payment service provider for the crypto industry. And what we're doing is building the bridge between the fiat world, you know, the US, Euro, Canadian world, and the digital asset world, the Bitcoin, Ethereum, via what we call the fiat on-ramps and the fiat off-ramps. Um, our business model is B2B, um, highly scalable, and we operate in a regulated environment. And I'll talk more about that as well. And really the most important point to note is whether the price of Bitcoin goes up or down, we still clip the ticket. Um, and in fact, the best thing for us, and, and as we already announced, May was the best month we had on record. And for th those of you that have been following the price of Bitcoin and Ethereum, it was the month that had the most volatility. So in fact, volatility is our friend. Um, and we actually like it when the price goes up and down in, in, those kind of, in that kind of manner. Um, in terms of just very quickly recapping uh, what we do, we do four core things. One is that we aggregate a whole series of global and local payment methods like MasterCard, Visa and Apple Pay, as well as local payments like Interact in Canada, Poly in Australia, Ideal in the Netherlands. And I'll talk more about why that's important and how that is different to our competitors. We then wrap that with our regulatory and compliance layer. We have a number of licenses around the world uh, because in order to operate in this space today, um, you need to be regulated. It's just, it's the industry, unlike when we got involved in 2014. And then that's underpinned by our data science automation platform, which is basically our own proprietary tech stack that runs everything from data pricing and payments to ultimately delivering the coin to the customer in the most efficient way and without getting too geeky on and off chain type delivery solutions. We then Dominic, yeah, yes, sorry. Martin. Yeah, just you're not actually a trading platform. I, I wouldn't go on your platform and buy and sell Bitcoin or whatever. I get it from my bank into a safe place or out of the bank and so forth. It, it's yep. the, you, you help move it around. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. So, so, so the, the, the way it's, it's actually opportune time. So what we do is we wrap this into a widget or an API and then we plug it into global crypto to crypto exchanges or wallets around the world. So if you go on to ed, download edge wallet today, or you log on to Binance or KuCoin or bit it, as a crypto to crypto exchange, you go there and you start with zero, um, zero um, coins, uh, zero fee at money. And so you click on Banksa, we'll onboard you, take you through our AML KYC process, which takes about five minutes. Um, then, for example, you want to buy $500 or $1,000 worth of Bitcoin. You click a few buttons and then, you know, two minutes later, you'll have it sitting in your Edge wallet or in your Binance account, ready for you to then start trading, whether you want to trade BTC ETH pairs or a BTC USDT pair. Um, so we, we're not actually an exchange in the sense. We provide the fiat on-ramps as well as the fiat off-ramps. Um, so that's the business model. It's, it's a bit like... If you want to sort of look at the e-commerce world, um, we're like the Stripe or the PayPal for the crypto industry. 
but we do more than just payments, as you would have seen on the other slide. It's a whole compliance layer and then obviously delivering the coin as well. And if and, I'm trying to throw some money up on Binance or, or whatever, then I have a choice. I'll do it on my MasterCard, my credit card, or I can make, maybe connect um, with a wire transfer, my bank account, do it. I've got various means to then get it onto the, the crypto exchange. And, and, and that's one of the big differences between ourselves and our competitors. Most of our competitors offer credit card only or maybe one other payment method. We offer over a dozen different payment methods. And the reason that's, you know, in my view, a competitive advantage is that local payment methods are typically faster and cheaper. Credit card is inherently expensive, roughly 5%. That's not us. That's just the whole industry because credit card is expensive in this sector. And so if you're buying a 500 or even a $1,000 worth, you won't worry about a 5% fee. But if you're buying five or $10,000 worth of Bitcoin, then you will be worrying about that kind of fee. That's where you want to use a local payment method. If you're in Canada, you want to use Interact. If you're in the US, you use Y or ACH. If you're in Australia, you want to use Poly. Uh, and, and so that's basically that. And in order to do that, you need to have a local company, a local bank account, which then means you need to be adhering to local registrations and local licenses. And, and just to give you some context, you know, our license in the Netherlands, that was a 12-month process. You don't just turn up to a country one day and say, I'm going to start trading. Um, there's a whole process that goes on in terms of getting the licenses, maintaining the licenses. Um, you know, it's, it's like a, and, and from the consumer end, it's like opening up a bank account or opening up a broking firm. You know, there's a whole process one needs to go through. Um, and, and in terms of, uh, you know, how do we make money? We clip the ticket and I'll talk more about our March numbers, March quarter numbers shortly. Um, that's the revenue model today. I say that that's our layer one. Um, moving forward, we will start to offer other products and services like fiat wallets, borrowing and lending. Um, and, and, and in fact, when we talk about product evolution, I can sort of give investors a bit of an overview around the next generation of our product. Um, the key way that we measure performance is through TTV, total transaction value. Um, as you can see, nice solid growth um, in TTV. December was you know, 100, March was 200. This quarter should be around 300. Uh, we've already reported April and May TTV. So, you know, the trend is continuing. Um, our March quarter numbers, um, and we did provide a May update only uh, last week. Um, so some of this stuff is, is actually slightly obsolete. But, you know, at a high level, um, our revenue for the March quarter was $21 million. Um, and I know I've had a, a number of questions from investors, you know, you know, how does that actually made up? And if you look at the detail, I think it's note 15 in the financials. Um, it's broken down both into agency revenue and principal revenue. And, and our revenue will basically ebb and flow depending upon the agency or print or um, principal um, uh, revenue recognition that we're utilizing. And uh, if people have got questions on it, I can be, I'll be able to answer those particular questions. But really the next point is around underlying EBITDA um, generated just, uh, just around or just shy of a million bucks, I should say, of adjusted EBITDA. Um, and as of today and as of last week, um, we have over $25 million of cash and cash equivalents on the balance sheet. So we raised money about three months ago. Uh, we've got the all the cash that we need, and it's really now about you know, head down, bum up. Um, really quickly on the capital structure, 45 million shares on issue. We have just shy of 4 million stock options, which are really employee options. Uh, making sure that everyone's absolutely aligned with the success of the organization. And uh, as mentioned, we're also listed on the OTC QX as well as Frankfurt in Germany. And uh, there's some research that's available on our website by Fundamental and RAAS for you to go out and download. Um, in terms of comparables, we don't have actually have any absolute direct comparables. Um, and that's just purely because we're the only pure playlisted PSP servicing digital assets but I've kind of given a bit of a grab bag of, of some other Canadian listed companies. And uh, I mean, just to give you an example, big, our revenues are bigger than big. Um, their market caps double our size. I partly just put that down to they're being listed for three years. We're being listed for six months. It's going to take us time to build trust and, and reputation in the marketplace. I'm um, doing programs like this, getting out there like end of this week, I'm in Germany. Um, hopefully in the next three or four weeks, I can actually visit North America um, and actually do a bunch of face-to-face -face meetings. So looking forward to getting back to um, you know, normality at some point in time. 
Um, in terms of in shareholders, uh, board and management are absolutely aligned with 25% of the company. The next three investors are all institutional funds. That's Allium, NGC, and Thorny. Um, and then we've got OKX Exchange and KuCoin, uh, who are our customers actually sitting on our register as well. Um, in terms of catalysts over the next 12 months, and I'm happy to expand on these, um, you know, continue building out the business. You know, TTV is obviously an outcome of things like growing our B2B customer base, adding more payments across Latin America, Asia, Africa, as well as expanding into DeFi and NFT. And in fact, um, one of our top five customers in June um, is actually a DeFi platform um, where you can go straight from fiat straight into DeFi a DeFi coin that generates the yields. And so there's these all these new opportunities that we're just really scratching the surface. Um, as mentioned, I'm, I'm the founder and chair. Uh, my other three non-exec directors, Jim Landau, Dodon Cohen, and Matt Kane. between the three of them have got over 50 years of, of public company and tech experience, led by CEO Holger, um, German national, and uh, and then uh, supported by Constantine and Josh, XCY, and Ian Clark, ex Goldman Sachs, rounding out the team. So that just gives you, a, let's call it a, a quick overview um, of uh, of the business. And uh, I guess you know now would be a really good time to try and take as, as many questions as possible. Um, maybe before I do that, I, I talked about product innovation um, today. All of our customers, so you, you see the four pillars with regards to what we do, these are effectively all in one. And what we're now in the process of doing, because we've actually had demand from some of the big US exchanges to basically unbundle what we do into effectively, you know, API-based microservices, which is just a another technical way to say um, they may want us to do the payments and the, um, the compliance, but they want to deliver the coin to the customer or they want to, us to do the delivery of the coin, but they want to do the payments and, and they want to leverage our licenses. And so we're going to allow some of these big global exchanges. And obviously I can't say who they are, but uh, there'll be household names in the US um, whereby, you know, we will be able to provide those kinds of, um, you know, services uh, for those, some of the big, some of those big exchanges. So all I'll say is over the next uh, little while, just watch this space. So that's really, let's call it the, the formal part. Um, uh, someone asked, how much cryptocurrency does banks hold? Um, uh, the answer there is it, it depends according to the quarter. Um, you know, sometimes we hold a little, sometimes we hold a lot. I, I can't tell you what we're holding right now, um, other than to say it floats. Uh, and, and part of that will be based upon, you know, how we operate and generate revenue from a um uh, let's call it a, a, an agency basis or a principal basis, which obviously has an impact on, do we count for two or 3% of that as revenue or 100% of the revenue without wanting to sort of get all sort of geeky from a financial perspective and talking about revenue recognition. Um, uh, someone, uh, uh, someone else asked, what is the com company's marketing initiative for 2021? I mean, we've just raised some money um, only a couple of months ago. We're, we're now building out our marketing team um, very soon we'll be appointing a new CMO, uh, Chief Marketing Officer across the group. Um, and given our model is B to B to C, the focus is on continuing to build out our B to B customer base because obviously they've got all the B to C customers. And um, and then um, you know that's kind of like at one level of marketing. And then two, from an investor relations perspective, because I do speak to some of my investors about this, um, now that COVID's starting to, to kind of settle down, um, as I mentioned uh, earlier, I'm actually off to Germany at the end of this week. Um, and then in a couple of weeks time, we'll be um, uh, focused on a number of other key markets in Europe. And at some point in time, I'd love to get across to North America and, and have one-on-one -on -one conversations with institutions. So that's, let's call it the sort of high level overview. Uh, Martin, I know you've got questions and there's some other questions coming through as well. Yeah, um, you, you uh, for those not who um, uh, up to speed, when you say you're adding D, a Di DeFi platform, what exactly do you mean by that? For us newbies, uh, can you explain what that decentralized finance uh, platform, what does that mean? Yeah, so so just to um, kind of illustrate that point, um, and I was actually going to try and bring up the Prezo um, again, just to um, illustrate our, our sort of key customers. Hopefully you can see our key customers. Um, so today, most of the customers that we have brought on board are crypto to crypto exchanges where you can do a BTC ETH pair or BTC USDT. Now, 
there's a really a, a lot of interest in DeFi these days, decentralized finance. And um, if you want to get exposure to DeFi, um, it was quite a convoluted process. You had to go from, uh, let's call it US or Canadian dollars, buy some Bitcoin. Um, at that point, you'd maybe do a, a wrapped Bitcoin. Uh, you'd use something like MetaMask and then use a decentralized exchange like SushiSwap. Now, that's about four or five hops. And for those that aren't technically savvy, I've kind of already lost them at the first, first hop. Um, so what new exchanges like Cake DeFi, which is one of our customers do, it allows you to go straight from fiat directly into a coin that starts generating a yield. And so there's this whole new opportunity in DeFi that we're now really pushing and, and starting to build out that will allow consumers to um, not only trade different coins, but also to get exposure and generate yield. There's a whole new opportunity that people have, have heard, of, uh, must have read about around NFTs, non-fungible tokens, which is really about content distribution. I think that this is really going to spur on a whole new wave of um, content creation. And, uh, and so my, my view is, um, you know, we will be doing deals um, and we're actually in discussions with a number of NFT platforms about allowing customers go, to go straight from NFT or sorry, from Fiat into an NFT product without all of those hops, without going from Bitcoin to Ethereum, um, et cetera, et cetera. And so we're just really trying to make it really simple for consumers to enter this whole new digital asset market. Sorry, and as a as sort of a primer for people, when you say a, a DeFi platforms that have a yield to it, is that like a yield as we sense in a, a preferred stock or a bond? Or, or what do you mean by a yield? And can you just flesh that out a bit more? Yeah, so you'll be able to buy certain coins um, that allow, allow you to generate yield. When I say yield, think of it as an interest rate, 5, 10, 15% interest rate, because then they're either staking, they're yield farming, so those coins or protocols are generating yield across different platforms. And there's this, you know, decentralized finance is really taking all the kinds of products that you would normally get in the traditional finance space, but doing them in a, in a, in a way that gives everyone equal access to, you know, the information, and the tools. And so I, you know, I mean, for example, today, I'm on a number of different DeFi platforms. I'm generating yields anywhere from 5 to 15%, um, which in my view is better than having my money sitting in a bank. And that's really the next big wave that we're starting to see um, in the whole DeFi space. And so Banksa is helping facilitate the going from fiat straight into DeFi for those that don't have a, you know, a PhD in computer science. Gotcha. Okay. All right. So basically the, the crypto world with DeFi and NFTs, it's exploding and, and evolving and, and you're going to, wherever it goes, you're, you're going to try to find the, be the on-ramp into that, make the whole, because make it all easier. Because like you were saying, you got four steps to bounce through it. It gives most people kind of a headache. And if you have a day job, trying to sort that all out in the meantime, it, it's tricky. So you're basically making things easier for people wanting to get into the world of crypto. Um, someone else asks, um, what's the opinion of the banks of share price? Do you think you are fairly valued? Uh, I, I mean, that, that's always a hard one to answer. Um, I mean, obviously I've got a vested interest um, in, in saying, of course, um, it's undervalued, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, what would you expect me to, to say? Um, I, I, you know, there's a couple of research reports out there, their commission, just to be super clear, um, one actually came out yesterday with a, a, a target of eleven dollars. Um, one of the others was eight bucks. We're trading at about four right now. Um, you know, maybe the truth is somewhere in the middle. Like I'm not the expert. I'll let the market determine ultimately what that we're worth. But you know, I think at this at these kind of prices, personally, I think it's good value. But that's just the, my own personal opinion. Obviously, seek your own um, advice. And it's just I'm here for the long game. I mean, where, where the share price is really today, tomorrow next quarter really uh, you know do i care that much i mean i do care it'd be you know remiss of me and not saying i don't care but what i'm what i really care about is building the performance of the company building a solid foundation taking advantage of these this growth in DeFi, in nfts and the whole digital asset space and what's really important is where we where are we in two or three years time when we've got a, a solid strong position in the marketplace and i think you know the kind of valuation at that point 
will, will make us look you know, absolutely cheap right now. But obviously the proof is in the pudding, as they say. All right. Uh, in terms of you talked about your growth uh, opportunities into different markets, could you talk about like we're, we're basically halfway through the year? What kind of news flow should we, well, the type of news should could we expect through the remainder of the year? It's like you're connected to a different um, uh, uh, exchange. You've got some of these microservice APIs launched, or um, you're connecting to NFTs. What kind of things, though, or are there any big markets? that you're not currently in that you hope to get in and that you may yep. get into in the um, I, I, Asia and Latin America are, are clearly on our horizon um, and, uh, and just watch this initiative over the next six months. Uh, right now we have about a dozen different coins. We're about to add another 40 to 50 new coins onto our platform, um, which once again, it's the long tail. Um, you know, is it gonna move the needle? Yes, it is. Is it going to you know, add another 40, 50 X to our revenue? No, it's not. Um, because, you know, the biggest coins are Bitcoin, Ethereum, USDT as a stable coin. Um, I think that's not just news to us. That would be, you know, the, the whole industry. But, you know, ultimately providing customers with a greater breadth of coins. That's obviously part of our uh, uh, mantra. And at the same time, new payment methods. Um, we will um, be expanding our payment methods um, over the next uh, six to 12 months. And at the same time, turning on seller sell btc or sell sell a coin um i mentioned or i maybe briefly mentioned um most of our ttv or most of our revenue is based on on ramping and when i say on ramping it's going from fiat to bitcoin fiat to ethereum um, we've turned on off ramping which means going from bitcoin or ethereum or other coins back into cash whether it's US dollar, Australian dollar, Canadian dollar. Um, we've turned that on in the Australian marketplace. It's our home marketplace. It's a good test market. Um, we just wanted to get it right. And, and you'll see us over the next six or so months, roll this out in the rest of the world. You may ask, why haven't we done it already? There are uh, a number of technical um, hops as well as compliance hops. And what I mean by that is we need to check, for example, the providence of the coin check the providence of the wallet to make sure it hasn't been used for nefarious purposes. And there's also some compliance checks off, check offs as part of that particular process. Um, so you will see that, um, my view is that will have a, an impact, a positive impact on our TTV. Um, one of the other questions we get, are we looking to list, um, uh, we're obviously listed on the TSX, V, um, will we look to list on the TSX or US stock exchange? So we're, we're on TSX, V now, um, we're on the OTC QX now. Um, uh, as I've stated publicly previously, um, my view is Banksa belongs on NASDAQ. Um, one of the reasons we decided to list on the TSX V um, is that there is effectively like a fast track process once we've been listed for 12 months. So January, 2022, um, the company would have been listed uh, for 12 months on the TSX. Um, let's just say, I'm not going to tell you, you know, it's going to be at the start of the 2022 or at the end of 22, at some point in time, um, we will be listed on NASDAQ. Um, I think that's a natural progression for the company. Um, we think that being listed on NASDAQ, um, you know, at the right stage will actually help revalue the company because I think NASDAQ investors just have, a, I guess, a, a different view on things. And there's obviously funds on NASDAQ that cannot buy TSX type stocks. Um, and so we just really always saw the TSX as a really good stepping stone to NASDAQ. Well, yeah, it's just such a bigger audience there for people to, to trade. And, and there's a little more friction if you're an American trying to uh, trade in uh, Canadian. Uh, are there, is there any opportunity for you guys to do M&A? Is that at all on the, the horizon or is it all you're going to build yourself? Uh, never say never. I mean, that's one of the other beauties of being a listed company is that it, you know, we do have opportunity from an M&A perspective. Um, I think it's safe to say that between now and Christmas time, it's really the, maybe this is an Aussie saying, but head down, bum up. We're just so focused on organically growing the company that we're really not focusing too much attention on M&A because there is, there is growth there to be had. Um, and I think companies, you know, should look at M&A when they're trying to augment the growth that they're already trying to do. And, and we've got, we're just busy enough Having said all of that, undoubtedly, that is on our radar. Um, we will take it slowly because I think as, as 
um, in many investors that have been involved in um, other companies that have made acquisitions, you know, many acquisitions fail. Um, and so we just want to take a, a slow and steady and conservative approach when it comes to acquisitions. But for now, over the next two quarters, organic growth is absolute the core, absolutely the core focus. Um, going back to the first question where they asked how much uh, cryptocurrency you hold, you're not holding that in terms of uh, speculating on the market. That's more of a float or kind of a working capital. You've got some on your bank, to, on, your, on your balance sheet to help facilitate transactions in the background. Right. Is that basically it? Yeah. So, so we do actually hold, um, we did hold a little bit from a, a treasury perspective, but the bulk um, is being held as inventory. So basically, you know, we hold it there um, to basically help facilitate customer transactions. And, and this is where, without once again getting too deep into revenue recognition, when a customer buys a Bitcoin, we can either sell it as an agent where we go from our upstream provider directly to the customer. That's where we clip the ticket. Or if someone sells us a Bitcoin and we even hold that for 30 seconds and then resell it, that's then counted as principal. And I just want to provide that clarity because for those that looking at the accounts, unless they're looking at, I think it's note 15 or 16 and breaking it down and understanding the delta between agency and principal, you can actually get a little bit confused. Um, and, and so that's really the explanation there. But just to be super clear, we don't hold custody of coins on behalf of any third party, which significantly de-risks the company. We're a payment service provider. Sure, we will hold inventory to help facilitate the transactions, um, but you know, we're, not a, we're not a custodial wallet. On your balance sheet, you've got in your asset line deposits. Are those sort of, is there a debit side to that where that's owed to someone or, or are those your assets? They're our assets. So that's okay. there was about six point X million, if memory serves me correct. I don't have the finance, yeah. uh, the the sheet, the um, financials right in front of me, but it was around over that six million mark. And so, in order to facilitate easy, quick transactions for customers, we will have with our number of our upstream liquidity providers, we will have basically think of it as you know, it's, um, it's not cash. It may be USDT or Bitcoin sitting on those exchanges or Ethereum ready to send to a customer when the customer wants to buy. So, right. so, so, so in effect, it's like cash at bank, but technically from an accounting perspective, because we're working with upstream providers, they don't classify it as cash at bank yet. The accounting policies and the accounting institution hasn't caught up to crypto just yet. So those are your deposits at other locations that help sort of facilitate the- Exactly. Uh, gotcha. Exactly that. All right. Um, are you able to, um, for us non-crypto types out there, with the volatility in there, you see um, money as it's at least going on. Soon you'll be able to see money as it's leaving. How, sorry, how do people get their money off the exchanges now if there's no, um, like it's sort of Hotel California, you, you go in, but you can't leave? Or like, how, how do you get your fiat out? I mean, I've seen people go from crypto into um, prepaid cards or like prepaid debit cards or or other kind, it's just- Amazon it, cards, buy a lot yeah. of coffee with that with Starbucks or- Yeah, it, it's, it's, it's right now, it is really not as seamless. Having said that, most people are moving in, not out, um, yeah. but we still see that, we think that there's an opportunity for people to be moving in and out. Um, yeah. and, and so I think that's, that's a great opportunity for us as well as the whole ecosystem. Um, but you know, suffice to say, because you know, the, the industry is still so new, more people are looking to move in than out. Um, and uh, Martin, just touching on, on um, volatility, volatility is our friend. Um, and just to give you context, May was, um, for those that have been following Bitcoin and Ethereum, May was the month where it had the most volatility. I think it was like the second most volatile month in the history of, of Bitcoin and Ethereum. And for Banksa, that was actually our biggest record month that we've ever done. Um, and so volatility is good. When the price drops, those existing buyers buy the dip. As the price goes up, newbies and people who want to get involved in the space buy because there's, there's an element of FOMO. So the, the wild swings are actually really good for us. And we did this in analysis you know, over the last few years. When the market trades within a very narrow window, it's like the equity market or an exchange, um, we actually make less money. We actually want those big wild swings. 
Um, and, and, you know, I mean, I'm not going to provide any forecasts, but you only need to look at, you know, the more volatile, the more we're able to clip the ticket. The less volatile, the less we clip the ticket. So I say bring on volatility. The more volatility, the better. Do you take on it when you're you're on ramping? Do you take any risk where by the time the Bitcoin transaction actually gets processed until you've quoted the person that there's some sort of a lag or a spread that you could be on the wrong side of, or is uh, that all sort of managed away? Yeah, that that that's managed away. I mean, is there risk? Yes, there is, but we're talking literally 10, 15 seconds, maybe 20 seconds of risk, or some cases milliseconds of risk. Um, you know, it, it, there's volatility, but not volatility in in that. And, and obviously, we make that up in the spread um, as well. Um, you know, in terms of our commission and spread, we take all of that into consideration. And uh, and so um, that's not really, and that that's why we don't really hold um, you know much crypto on our balance sheet just because of the fact that we don't want to be having um, exposure to, the, to that volatility. If you're an on-ramp to different wallets or exchanges, could you be an on-ramp to, like, like you give your analogy to, e, um, to, to PayPal or, or that, could you be an on-ramp to like a commercial provider, like an Amazon or some online thing where you like sort of pay via bank, so with uh, Bitcoin or, or whatever, or is that not really... Yeah, uh, so, so so that there's in terms of some of the other verticals. Uh, I mean, we've we've been approached by a number of I'll call them more traditional fintechs um, and neo banks who want to who just offer typical feed accounts, maybe with a credit or a debit card, and they want to get involved in the crypto space. And so that's a discussion that we've been having with a number of different groups. Um, and I'd say they're more traditional banking players. And you know, could we, for example, uh, and, and we're not just to be, I uh, used Amazon as an example, I and mean, we're not in discussions with Amazon, but you know, could we be in discussions with Amazon to say, um, let's, let's add a widget onto Amazon or onto another website that would allow their customers to onboard with Banksa. And in fact, we're speaking to some of the big crypto websites uh, and basically looking to allow them to offer an ability for their consumers to buy crypto uh, through Banksa. So it's not just crypto to crypto exchanges and wallets and NFT um, and DeFi platforms. There's this whole other opportunity of, let's call it the more traditional websites um, that can also move into the space. And if you work on the hypothesis that you know, 100% of people exist in the fiat world, the US, Euro, Canadian dollar world, and only 2 or 3% getting, uh, are involved in the digital asset world. And if you believe the hypothesis that there will be a transition uh, a percentage of those people, whether it's 10, 20, 30, 40% over the next five to 10 years into this digital asset world, then companies like Banksa that facilitate those transactions are the ones that are going to ultimately be able to benefit and capitalize from, from that growth. And so this is what we're now starting to see are the traditional players wanting to move into, uh, into the crypto space and using companies like Banksa. You, I would think, have a very interesting perspective on the regulatory environment with uh, the cryptocurrencies, given that you're the, the, the on-ramp there. Can you give us any perspective on how they're viewing, like, because there's a lot of sort of bad news associated with um, uh, Bitcoin and cryptos right now as are so, uh, associated with the cyber terrorist attacks and, and, and sort of... Uh, um, blackmailing uh, kind of uh, situation. Uh, can you give us any perspective on what the world regulators, obviously a very <laughs> broad thing to talk about, but how, how are the regulators viewing sort of the, the evolution of cryptos here? And I, I would think they view people like you as being sort of a, a, a good actor in that space. Yeah. Um, firstly, the crypto genie is already out of the bottle. Any government around the world that has tried um, usually unsuccessfully to put it back. Um, you, you can't put it back. It's decentralized. You cannot control it. Um, and this is where governments around the world have been really looking at the fiat on-ramps and off-ramping as a way that they can at least have a, an understanding and, and monitor it and do full AML KYC on customers. And, and what we've seen, you know, there was no rules in 2014. There are significant rules. Um, and in fact, banks are, just to give you a little bit of history, um, uh, you know, we started out of Australia. Um, we were one of the founding members of an association. We lobbied the government for regulation. 
and we got one of the first licenses in the world um, out of Australia. In fact, Australia was the second country in the world behind Japan to actually issue crypto licenses. And the rest of the world has basically been catching up ever since. So we've really cut our teeth as a regulated organization. Our view was also always this industry will basically only get mass market and mainstream on the basis it is regulated. And just to be clear, fit for purpose regulation is what we're all about. Um, you, you bring up people using you know, Bitcoin and other coins for nefarious purposes. Um, all I'll say is that is one of the most silly things that anyone can even consider doing. Every single transaction on the blockchain is open, transparent. If I know your wallet address, I can see every single transaction coming through. And then what happens? Um, you, you'll basically be blacklisted or that particular wallet will be blacklisted and no one will basically trade with you before. And, and so, in fact, I think governments around the world have actually realized, in, in fact, trans, there is more transparency on the blockchain with Bitcoin, Ethereum and other coins than there is with cash, with US dollars. And in fact, most of the money laundering that goes on in the world is physical cash, as well as just traditional banking bank accounts. And so in terms of, um, you know, and we've obviously seen scams, you know, you don't just see it in the crypto space, but you see it in, in the real world as well. Um, those people kind of realized, I think, was it in the US, um, there was a, you know, the pipeline ransomware, they paid a bunch of money. Those Bitcoins have actually been seized. Um, yeah. and, and, and because if, if people are sending Bitcoin to a wallet, you can then just stop the wallet. Every exchange will stop dealing with that wallet. And so you might as well not have any money in there because you can't actually do anything with it. This is where people, and this is, I think once people realize that that's the case, they think this, because I know, I understand because I speak to a lot of people and they have this, you know, one of the misconceptions is, oh, it's used for money laundering and, and nefarious purposes. Like that's one of the pre sort of conceptions that people have. But once I explain to them, it's actually more open and transparent than cash and then then traditional bank accounts they kind of think oh, okay now i understand and and it kind of doesn't make any um you know any real sense to actually use bitcoin or ethereum for nefarious purposes um the first thing will happen you actually be end up being blacklisted and you can't do anything with those bitcoins so um actually i just saw a question come through uh, can you talk more about the off-rank capabilities how far along are we in the space? I think I've partly answered that, but just to sort of reiterate, we are already doing off ramps um, in Australia. Uh, it's tried, it's tested, it's working. Uh, we nailed down all the bugs. Um, and over the next six months, we will be rolling out the off ramps to the rest of the world. All right. Well, that's uh, good here. Um... Uh, we are almost, we're 40, almost 45 minutes into this. We're not getting any more questions. I've um, kind of gone through uh, my stuff. Can you, uh, do you any final comments here and then we can uh, wrap things up? I, I think just to sort of take a, a step back, just to kind of leave the audience with a, a couple of key, um, key points. Um, uh, actually, Tristan asks, what are the, some possible headwinds that banks could be facing in the short term? Um, I, I think one of the big challenges in the space um, is just, you know, finding the right team uh, and, and you know, p p making sure that we've got the right people in the right positions. We've grown very rapidly. We've grown from, I think, you know, 30-odd people 12 months ago to about 100 people around the world now. Um, you know, as we're scaling up our systems, we're also scaling up our people um, one of the reasons that we actually, you know, one of the other reasons um, that uh, we also listed the company was giving every single person in the company an ability to own part of the company, either the ability for them to be able to buy shares on market, um, which a number of our people have done, um, or participating in an option plan, uh, which gives um, our staff an ability to you know, continue growing um, their wealth as we grow our wealth for all of our shareholders. Um, so, so that they're really sort of some of the, you know, I guess, you know, challenges and that's, you know, not just for banks. So that's just business 101. Um, and, and, and I also think, you know, some of the other headwinds are just people's perception of crypto. It's still fairly new. And, and just to sort of, you know, reiterate the picture, this is like, um, 1997 in the internet days, uh, you know, Amazon was just born. 
Um, there were, um, you know, Google, Facebook, you know, Netflix, um, and those websites, Zoom, weren't, weren't even born yet. Um, you know, it's still so early in the evolution. And, and I remember um, there was this thing on, uh, was it, I think, NBC, um, uh, these, this morning program. I saw it on YouTube. If you, if you Google it, I'm sure you'll be able to find it. These NBC presenters um, talking about there's this thing called the, the, you know, they had their computer there, the old computer with the big screen. And, you know, this thing is called the internet. And there's something called email. And what you can do is you can send someone an electronic message and it goes through the, all these computers and gets to the other person. And, you know, one of the other presenters say, why would I want to send an electronic mail when I can, you know, the mail as in the traditional mail works perfectly well. We, we, this is never going to take off. And, and I kind of, some, you know, sometimes you need to look at the past in other verticals to kind of realize actually the same thing is happening in this space. Um, it's happening much faster because the rate of technical adoption is increasing significantly. And so my view is this is like 1997. The big behemoths are yet to actually be born in the space. And so, you know, it gives companies like banks are basically a blank sheet of paper uh, to effectively grow, build and dominate a segment of the marketplace. And, and our view is, you know, our view is payments, Payments are, are so um, uh, and, uh, such an important, integral part of uh, of this whole new layer that's being built. You know, payments. Think of the payments as layer one, and things like DeFi, NFT, really sit over the top as layer two type services. And so, you know, we're the picks and the shovels of the industry. Um, and and so that's really ultimately what I want to leave with investors is we're so early. We're the picks and the shovels of the industry. Um, and and I think this industry has so you know so much to go in terms of growth and opportunity well obviously like if the fact that an on-ramp is just you've just built that and the off-ramp is still being constructed as we're speaking here and and like there's only less friction to come within the, the market and more opportunities lending and collateralized and who knows what anything that wall street sort of figured out um you guys have are building sort of the decentralized finance uh, version of that in, in the background. And then once with that technology, you can put all sorts of new permutations into it. So yeah, if, if we're just building up the off-ramp right now, we've got a long way to go. And these right. are the rounds. All right, Dominic, thank you very much. That was really interesting. Very uh, learned a lot here. That's great. I uh, hope everyone else did too. And thank you very much. That was great. Fantastic. Thanks. Uh, thanks. Uh, and uh, banks.com if anyone wants any more in information on the company. Thanks, Mark. All right. Have a great All right, day. Thanks. And Cheers. shoot me an email and I can forward it to Dom if there are any other questions or comments to be done. Thank you.